and I'm one of the co sorry, of Diversity Chicago Collective. We are a small um, local-based organization looking to support uh, diverse students and uh, potential students, including, you know, our goal was to work with even um, CPS someday um, and clinicians of diverse backgrounds and really help just diversify our fields and create a safe place, a community where we can kind of be able to support one another, mentor one another, and continue also, most importantly, to help the community that we live in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. And it's been really, really cool to get to collaborate with y'all um, and just kind of work together because teamwork honestly makes the dream work. So it's really cool to see people in different areas of justice work um, and what y'all do uh, for the Chicago community is awesome. So thank you so much. Um, all right. Like I said, we'll get started. So the today's meeting, let me pull it up, share my screen. So we will be looking at fighting for occupational freedom in Florida and beyond. So we're gonna be taking a closer look at EOTA Inspire 2024 using an occupational justice lens. So let's use the framework that we've all, uh, you know, that OT is based on um, and founded in um, some of those justice principles and take a closer look about what's going on in Florida, but not just Florida, all states that have anti de I laws, anti LGBTQ plus laws, uh, anti immigration laws, etc. This is, as you can see from the Supreme Court decisions that have been uh, that were made uh, at the last week uh, surrounding LGBTQI plus individuals, we see that it is a national emergency because this is a population that is under attack um, as well as other minority populations. Um, you know, full disclosure, I am a black queer trans individual. So I've got a lot of skin in this game. Um, so a lot of what I talk about is also deeply personal, right? These are experiences that I have, that I have had some of these negative experiences and just want to bring broader education as to what's going on in some political uh, education as well. So we will get started. So our learning objectives for today, first, we are, you will be able to define what occupational justice is by the time we get done with this uh, presentation today. Uh, you will be able to identify the types of the five types of occupational injustices. Uh, you should be able to explain how current Florida laws impact occupational functioning for various populations, and then be able to identify two to three ways to participate in the dismantling of systemic barriers to occupational participation um, in the context of AOTA 2024. So as always, here are our community agreements. So I would appreciate it if all of us could speak from the I perspective, avoid speaking for others using we, us, or them. I uh, encourage you to listen actively, listen to understand and not to respond. Sometimes we start to formulate our response. Instead, let's give 100% of our focus to whomever's speaking. Um, the next is step up, step back. So if you usually speak often and find yourself talking more than others, challenge yourself to lean into listening and opening space for others. If you usually don't talk as much in groups um, and do a lot of thinking and processing in your own head, know that the group would love to hear from you and challenge you to bring your voice forward in this conversation. Um, so respect silence. Don't force yourself to fill silence. Silence can be an indication of thought and process. Share, even if you don't have the right words. Suspend judgment and allow others to be unpolished in their speaking. If you're unsure of their meaning, ask them for clarification. The next is to uphold confidentiality. So treat the honesty of others as a gift. Assume that personal identities, experiences, and perspectives shared in this space are confidential unless you're given permission to use them and to lean into discomfort. So learning happens on the edge of our comfort zones. Push yourself to be open to new ideas and experiences, even if they initially seem uncomfortable to you. So if we are okay with these community agreements, if y'all could give me a thumbs up, either in the chat or response or on camera, I would appreciate that. If 
you have an agreement that you would like to add, you can drop it in the chat. If you have a question, raise your hand. If not, I'm going to keep on keeping on. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for all the thumbs up. Also, this will be a participatory um, meeting here today, so I'm not here just to lecture you all. I will be asking for your input as well, um, because this is the whole purpose of this space, so we can all have a chance to learn and grow together. Uh, so here are our learning environment behavior and uh, behaviors and expectations. So this first and foremost is an anti-racist learning space. There will be a zero tolerance policy for racism, sexism, classism, ableism, transphobia, homophobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and hate speech or actions that attempt to silence, threaten, or degrade others. Um, here in this learning space, we should engage in mutual respect with one another and uphold our community agreements. Um, and the last is to respect diverse styles of expression, respect different styles for presenting, respect different lived experiences and viewpoints, and respect different ways of knowing, right? So there are multiple ways to know something. So we're going to respect all of that between people. Okay, so can I get a thumbs up if we're cool with these learning environment behavior and expectations? Cool, cool, cool. I see thumbs up, thumbs up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, cool. Thank you, everyone. All right, on to the good stuff, which is why we came here today to talk about what is going on in Florida. Um, so as we begin, I actually, just so you all are able to follow along better, let me go ahead and drop something in the chat for you. Um, so this will also be, um, emailed out to everyone at the end of this session, but I just wanted to put this in here. If you go to this Google Drive link, you'll be able to have access to all of the materials that we've put together um, to help encourage engagement with this topic and for learning. You can also find a copy of the presentation in this folder if you would like to follow along, because I know some people like to follow along on their own. Um, so you will be able to, to find that there. Um, yes, so I will get back to this. Okay, so what is going on in Florida? So Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and the Republican Party have passed a series of laws that negatively impact LGBTQ plus people, Black people, Latinx people, people from low SES backgrounds, immigrant communities, DACA recipients, children, and women. Um, and the laws are so severe that both the NAACP and LULAC in addition to the Human Rights Campaign and Equality Florida have issued travel advisories to Florida. Um, the travel advisories explicitly warn Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ plus populations that it is currently too dangerous to travel to Florida due to the severity of Florida laws. So how does this relate to occupational justice? So let's talk about what occupational justice is. Hawking defines occupational justice as a concept that is concerned with enabling, mediating, and advocating for environments in which all people's opportunity to engage in occupation are just, health-promoting, and meaningful. Um, there are three foundational concepts to occupational justice. One, that humans are inherently occupational beings. So, this means that the things people do are a determinant of health. That implies that occupational justice is only served when conditions allow people to engage in occupations in ways that are consistent with their culture and beliefs and sustain well being. Additionally, occupational justice has an inclusive agenda in specifying that people are appropriately supported to participate in occupation. We see that occupation is contextually embedded. So for this, 
I'm going to actually put it to the audience since we're all OTs here. What are the different contexts that we consider when we say occupation is contextually embedded? What does that mean? You guys can either, you can raise your hand or you can drop it in the chat. I'll respond to either. Physical, social, cultural. Thank you, Brent. Diana says home, family. Exactly. So these are different contexts in which we can understand a human or understand a person attending to their occupations. So here are the other occupational contexts that we understand people through. Um, it means structural factors. So that includes things like the economy, policies, um, policies at the regional, national, and international levels, and the values underlying those policies and cultural values. It also, uh, like we said, can be physical, social, cultural context, and also political context. So a political context is also one in which we can view occupation. That is a context. Um, and then third, for the three foundational concepts of occupational justice, according to Hawking, is that engaging in occupation can improve the lives of people in vulnerable situations. So that means occupational justice is concerned with enabling, mediating, and advocating for environments for which all people's opportunities to engage in occupation are just health promoting and meaningful. So that's the foundational concepts that led to the overall idea of occupational justice. So, sorry, here we see our occupational injustices further defined. So there are five types of occupational injustices. There's occupational deprivation, which occurs when people are excluded for occupations due to factors outside of an individual's control. So we'll start here. With occupational deprivation, based off of this definition, can people put either raise their hand or put in the chat, what are some examples of occupational deprivation? So this occurs when people are excluded for occupations due to factors outside of an individual's control. What could that look like? Yeah, not being able to safely use the toilet at a conference. That's exactly what occupational deprivation could look like. It looks like reduced accesses to goods and services, exactly, physical inaccessibility, lack of access to objects and settings, exactly, preventing someone from playing sports, and laws that restrict participation, exactly, exactly, exactly. Being incarcerated and not being able to do what you want to do, oh, absolutely, having no choice, being barred from participation activities. Thank you everyone for those responses. Exactly, that's exactly what occupational deprivation can look like. Then we've got occupational imbalance, which occurs when people are over, under, or unoccupied. So what are examples of people who are experiencing occupational imbalance or what populations do we see occupational imbalance most in? So this occurs when people are over, under, or unoccupied. Yeah, we see this a lot in students. Where else do, who else do we see this? Working too much. And Ari, just to go a little bit more, typically who are people who are forced into working too much? Oh, there we go. Brent got it. Low income populations, people in nursing homes who have a lack of engagement with different occupations, um, people, low SES. Thank you, Ari, for coming back for that. Also, I think someone mentioned um, our incarcerated population for occupational deprivation. They are also experience occupational imbalance. Also, honestly, any person in any type of facility. Ooh, POC faculty that spend more time educating their colleagues on diversity and inclusion instead of doing their work or research. Just absolutely, absolutely. That is also occupational imbalance. And then Joey says unhoused folk. Yes, exactly. Thank you everyone for all of those examples. It's very important that we contextualize what these words mean and how we do see these occupational injustices occur in society on a daily basis.
The next is occupational alienation. So this occurs when there is prolonged experiences of disconnectedness and isolation. So please tell me what are some examples of occupational alienation? So prolonged experiences of disconnectedness and isolation. Um, Immigrant populations, exactly, people who are incarcerated, individuals experiencing depression. I guess this can all be populations that are experiencing occupational alienation. People with behaviors that make them seem different to those who don't understand them, yes. Those in institutions, exactly. Individuals experiencing homelessness, not crediting indigenous scientists for their insights. Ooh, thank you, Josephine, exactly. Um, the effects of COVID-19 on all populations, absolutely. Um, and with heightened awareness to anyone who was in a facility at kind of the height of COVID-19 precautions, right? Because that is where some of those rules were the strictest. And then being bullied into not participating into your preferred activities. Ooh, Vanessa, that has a little undertones of just say no to ABA. I, I'll follow up with you on that after because I like that. Yeah, exactly. So these are all examples of occupational alienation. Then we have occupational marginalization. So this occurs when there are invisible and informal norms and expectations that impact opportunities. So this is exclusion based off of habits, traditions, and unexamined behavior rather than laws and policies. So where might we see some occupational marginalization? Expectations of perfect speech. Ooh, yes, Diana, yes. Um, academia in sports. Prioritizing traditions over current human rights needs. Workplace discrimination. Ex oh, yes, exactly. These are all excellent examples of what occupational marginalization can look like. Okay. And then the last is occupational apartheid. Um, and this comes from Wilcock and yes. Hawking. Um, and for them, apartheid, occupational apartheid occurs when people are systemically segregated and deliberately- Will you denied. get me one of their cut up mangoes? Oop, I'm just gonna mute whoever that is. All right, so occupational apartheid occurs when people are systemically segregated and deliberately denied access to occupations, such as quality education or well-paid work or occupational context based on prejudice about their capacities or entitlement of benefits of culturally valued occupations. So where and how can we see occupational apartheid? So trans exclusionary laws. Yeah, trans folks in Florida are currently experiencing occupational apartheid. Folks who have been institutionalized absolutely experience occupational apartheid. Um, Cost prohibitive and structurally prohibitive conference gatherings promote occupational apartheid. Yes, Josephine. Shannon, exclusion of trans people from sports and bathrooms. Absolutely, that is occupational apartheid. And individuals who are incarcerated and POC and transgender community in Ohio. Taylor, I do not know who you are, but I am originally from Ohio. And yeah, it's there's a lot going on over in Ohio currently. Um, okay, thank you. And just uh, for the rest of this presentation, if you do write something in the chat, I do want to acknowledge you by name. So if you could change your name to what you uh, like to be called, I would love that as well, just so I can respect all of you in that. Um, and then Josephine also said, lack of hybrid virtual knowledge um, translation offerings. Great, thank you. Yes, these are all, all examples of these occupational injustices that we see in society at large. Mm, so a lack of virtual accommodations can cause the apartheid. Thank you for the clarification. And I also agree. So what does any of this have to do with AOTA Inspire 2024, right? Well, AOTA Inspire 2024 will be held in Orlando, Florida. 
as we saw in the beginning of this presentation with the travel advisories um, from several different population groups, traveling to the state of Florida is currently unsafe for several populations, which includes LGBTQ plus individuals, Latinx individuals, Black um, individuals, immigrants, people from low SES backgrounds, um, people who are religious minorities, such as Muslims. And I want to say religious minorities in the United States. I would like to acknowledge that Muslim people globally are not a religious minority. Um, and DACA recipients amongst other populations. Um, oh, sorry, women and children should also be on there. So these are all the populations who Florida is currently unsafe for. So if OTPs, so OT practitioners, and throughout this presentation today, when I say OTPs, or if I say occupational therapists, I do mean OTs and COTAs. I think of us all as occupational therapists. So if OTPs and students from these backgrounds travel to Florida, they are at an increased risk of systemic harm and experiences of occupational injustice. This can look like police harassment, brutality, and incarceration. They might experience harassment in bathrooms. They'll be open to physical violence, sexual harassment, psychological and emotional harm, threats of deportation or ICE detention, and racial profiling. So this is the risk for people from these backgrounds of traveling to Florida for this conference. So then, because it's a one-two punch, is what does this have to do with AOT PAC? So for those of you who don't know, AOT PAC is uh, AOTA's political action committee. So this is the committee that works to target politicians um, to uh, donate money to in the hopes that their political agenda will support OT's political agenda, which obviously is related to things like Medicare and Medicaid, reimbursement, um, and related to uh, just our rights as practitioners, all of the things that AOT PAC advocates for. You can actually learn more about them on the AOTA website. So this relates because AOT PAC currently donates to politicians who support the laws that are being created in Florida. So for example, Vernon Buchanan, a Republican in Florida, has received over $10,000 from AOT PAC since 2018. Here's his voting record from 2021 to 2022 Congress. It was no to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, no to the American Rescue Plan, no to the Inflation Reduction Act, no for the to the For the People Act, no to the assault weapons ban, no to the American Dream and Promise Act, no to the Women's Health Protection Act of 2021, no to the Equality Act, no to the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act, no to Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and no to the Consumer Fuel Price Gouging Act. So all of this information can be found on opensecrets.org and you can search AOT PAC, and you can see all of the places that their money, uh, where the money and donations go to. But any donation to AOT PAC, if you are from one of these populations that are impacted by these laws, is a dollar to AOT PAC is a, is a dollar against your own well-being. Um, because it, that's you're, you're funding people who want to legislate you out of existence. Um, so that is the kind of one-two punch, right? We can't be giving money to people who want to see us dead. We can't be giving money to people who do not want us to have access to voting. We can't be giving money to people who do not want women uh, to have autonomy over their own bodies. We can't be donating to politicians who don't see that there is a gun control is a huge issue in our society, uh, not just society at large, but specifically for children. We have to think about all of the political violence um, that happens. Also, yeah, let alone offer ethical therapy services to these populations. Exactly. So this is what it all has to do with. And then I actually want to pause here and show you another thing from our um from the from the google drive so let me go back here and i will share my screen
All right. So within this fighting for occupational freedom in Florida, within this action pack, you will have access to several things, including you'll have all of the information that I have specifically about AOT PAC, just so you can read more for yourself here. So this is what AOT, oh, AOT PAC is. This is straight from AOTA's website. I have not changed their words or misrep misrepresented any of their viewpoints. So this is directly from the website. Um, this is, if you go to opensecrets.org, this is how you can see all the political contributions that have been made overall by AOT PAC, because I want to paint the full story. So again, this is opensecrets.org, look at AOT PAC. These are the top 10 candidate recipients. Yes, Josephine. I don't want to super interrupt your flow, but uh, back in 2014, I was on the Emerging Leader Development Program in affiliation with the PAC. And so if there comes something up, I'm, I'm happy to share insight about how we might be able to mobilize and um, getting more active uh, activist involvement with the PAC. So I'd be happy to share some of my cultural capital about that. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think because it, it is important that we pay more attention to where, where this money is going, because once you start digging, it gets pretty ugly. So these are the top 10 candidate recipients of 2022. So again, these are both Republican and Democrat. Um, and here we focus on some of the, uh, this was the top uh, recipient of $10,000. So Jason Smith, Republican from Missouri, where we just had conference, also has a similar voting record to that of Vernon Buchanan in Florida. So no to assault weapons ban of 2022, no to the American Rescue Plan. So you guys can go through all of this. And I also have a brief synopsis of what all of these bills uh, that they're voting no to uh, look at. So economic relief, addressing climate change, expanding voter registration. Um, the American Dream and Promise Act specifically speaks to immigration bill. Um, and we are looking at women's uh, reproductive rights and all of that. So, yo, sorry, Josephine, is your hand still up or is that just no, sorry, I didn't, I forgot. Oh, there okay, no, 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 no worries. I just wanted to make sure that I was giving you an opportunity uh, to participate. So this is all in there. And again, I don't want you all to just take my word for it. Go to AO, go to opensecrets.org and look up AOTPAC. You will be able to see all of this information for yourself. But I think it's really important to understand that not only are we going to a place with these laws, we are paying people <laughs> to, to kind of enact these laws on us. So that information and just about everything that I talk about here today is here Okay, yes, Josephine. Oh, just briefly, and I'm not certain how much this could have changed because I was last actively involved almost 10 years ago. But uh, from what I understand, the structure, so the PAC is, it has to be legally a separate organization from AOTA. And that's why like usually at AOTA, they have one big fundraising event. And then at the time that I was involved, there was a program where you could sign up to like have micro donations go towards the PAC. Um, I think that it is a central committee of usually people that are tightly affiliated within the AOTA community that tend to like sit on boards and discuss how these funds are allocated. However, there's I, at the time that I was involved, there was something called Circle of Advisors, which was delegated based on regions throughout the United States. And at the time that I was last connected to it, many of those vacancies were not filled. So we had parts of the United States that were unrepresented, which I just wanna feature that as a possible activist um, opportunity that we have to maybe fill and steer how these contributions are delegated. Um, there are ways that we might be able to work within AOTA a little bit or disrupt who's representing on that board and how those funds are allocated because I think there might be still some voids um, and maybe some demands for oversight and transparency and how those funds are allocated. At the time that I was involved with the PAC, 
it wasn't really transparent how that dialogue was occurring. But do know that it is a separate organization from AOTA, um, loosely affiliated and connected. Thank absolutely. you for getting that. Oh, yeah. no, absolutely. So thank you for making that clear. And I, I want to be clear. AOTA and AOT PAC are two separate organizations. This is in relation to making an explicit donation to AOT PAC. So any donation to AOT PAC as it stands currently is a donation against all of these populations. Um, and then we've got Brent, who's says, in full disclosure, I am a board director for AOT PAC. I'm here to listen and learn and don't want to redirect the presentation slash conversation. I'm not here to represent the PAC, but can answer factual questions. Okay, great. So thank you for making that known, Brett, that you're here so you can answer some questions for us, because it is very highly disturbing, even with those vacancies that you do mention, Josephine, that a, a board came together, looked at these voting records and said, yes, these are the people that we'd like to give money to. So it is important that we know what's going on, who is on the board of directors, and that we do apply this outside pressure because it is actually unacceptable um, that that is what we're doing. And even though AOTA and AOT PAC are two separate organizations, at some point, AOTA and AOT PAC, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brent, it, it, they're in communication with one another, right? So this is not like AOTA does not know what AOT PAC is doing and AOT PAC doesn't know what AOTA is doing, right? So these are all organizations that have communication with one another and are the leaders of our profession nationally. And this is this is what we're doing. Um, so yeah, so let's get back into it. Let me share my screen with you all. Okay, awesome. So that's kind of that connection to AOTA and conference and the connection to AOT PAC. So that is what we're talking about. So what are these laws anyway? So this is a whole overview of some of the most extreme bills that have been proposed, um, some of which have been officially signed into law and have been effective since July 1st of this year. So it, just by kind of looking at the titles of these laws, right, you wouldn't say like, oh, there's, there's nothing that stands out as like, oh, this is terrible. This is bad. These like, oh, there's a bill about education. Okay, there's a bill about individual freedom. Here's a bill about parents' rights. What could these things be? So they're all kind of purposefully innocuously named. Because again, if you were just a lay person looking at the titles of these uh, bills and laws, you wouldn't really feel too alarmed about what's inside of them. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. So again, I'm actually going to one last time, this should be my last time, redirect us back to the, um, to the Google Drive. So within the Google Drive for today, there will be, uh, a document called Fighting for Occupational Freedom, a resource guide. So at the top, you'll find an action plan, and those will be things we talk about later in the conversation. But if you come down here, every single law, bill, advisory that I mentioned in this presentation today, here it is. So you can go directly to the source yourself. So once we open this, this will take you straight to the um, to the Florida for example, it'll take you straight to the Florida Senate. So you can read these all for yourself. I am not trying to convince you of anything. I promise that you have all the information there for yourself. Yes, Josephine. Oh, sorry, just real quick. I just noticed that there is currently um, until July 26, there's an open call for anybody on the call that might be in region one, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, Vermont, or the Virgin Islands can um, apply and nominate themselves to be on the AOT a path. So just because that's a short deadline, I thought I would put that out there. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so that's a way to get involved and let our voice be heard saying we have to, have to, have to, have to stop donating to politicians who wish us harm. 
So we're going to take a closer look at these laws and what's really inside of them. And like I said before, I, you all have access to all of the original materials where I found all of this and also some of these uh, documents that help me to interpret the laws, right? Because I'm not a lawyer. I do not purport to be a lawyer. I'm not a lawmaker. So I also use different tools to help me understand. So on the slide that you'll see the language from the bill. Um, and like I said, the resource guide lets you have all the links to everything I have. And then I verbally will give a summary of the bill and will examine its real world implications. Um, all of the bills that I am talking about today were signed into law in May, 2023 and went into effect July 1st, 2023, uh, with the exception of the Stop Woke law that went into effect of July of 2022. Um, there will be several bills listed throughout. I'm going to highlight the ones that have been signed into law today. So the first one is the uh, HB 1557. This is the one, um, and just by a show of like a thumbs up, hands up, if you've if you've heard, don't say gay, like the don't say gay bill, this is what they're talking about. It's HB 1557 is don't say gay, because that took me, first of all, a long time uh, to even be able to figure out what was what was even meant by that. Um, so with here, with don't say gay, this was signed into law of March 28th, 2022, and went into effect July 1st, 2022. Um, and the reason why you've seen it kind of more in the news lately is because they expanded don't say gay from K through three to K through eighth grade. So that's why you've seen um, this conversation come back up, but it has been in effect for a year now. Um, the, the most controversial section of the act prohibits public public schools from having classroom discussions or giving classroom instruction about sexual orientation or gender identity from kindergarten through eighth grade in a manner deemed against the state standards in all grades. It also prohibits public schools from adopting procedures or student support forms that maintain the confidentiality of a disclosure by a student, including of the gender identity, gender identity or sexual orientation of a student from parents. So if a student confides in you, actually, I have they, them pronouns. Actually, my pronouns are he, him. Actually, I, I'm a lesbian, I'm gay, I'm bisexual. It, this is all information that you would have to tell the parents if the student discloses that to you. And it requires public schools to bear all the costs of all lawsuits that are filed by aggrieved parents. Um, the language is very vague in the don't say gay bill and is very, it's highly subjective to interpretation. Uh, the preamble of the bill muddles matters further um, because it not only prohibits the in instruction around gender identity and sexual orientation, but also classroom discussion of these topics. So a classroom instruction could mean eliminating books in the classroom with LGBTQ plus characters or historical figures. No, no classroom discussion is a broad phrase. And it could mean that teachers with a student with gay parents, you know, shouldn't talk about those families with the entire class. So that is a, one of the biggest, biggest concerns with the don't say gay bill is this is so expansive. So here we see a real world application. So there was a teacher in Florida called Jenna Barbie and she showed the Disney movie, uh, Strange World. Give me a thumbs up or hands up if you've like seen or heard of Strange World. It's, it's like a kid's movie, Disney movie. I watched it, I thought it was cute. Um, I don't even think I realized one of the main characters was queer. Yeah, exactly. So she showed this movie, uh, which is rated PG to her fifth grade class. One of the main characters in the movie is gay. Um, the student's parents had signed a permission slip earlier in the year, allowing her to show PG films. Um, so Barbie, Jenna Barbie, who is in her first year as a teacher, she was reported to the Florida State Education Department for indoctrination before anyone had even spoken to her. She was, at the time this article was written, she was under official in investigation for possible violations of the Parental Rights and Education Act, um, dubbed Don't Say Gay Law, which was introduced by DeSantis. So this is a real world example of how these laws are, are very vague, 
right? So you show a Disney movie with permission and now you're under investigation by the, by the, um, Department of Education. And again, all of these articles that I'm referencing are within um, the within that document. So you can read the whole thing for yourself. So exactly. So the first question here are what what populations are impacted by this bill by don't say gay? Who who do we think will see a large brunt of this? I had a little bit of trouble following your question. Okay, so what, and I'll just, for this one, for example, LGBTQ plus populations are gonna be heavily impacted by by this law, uh, kids, because they can't function. Who else are, who else, right? So I have a few examples, but I know there are more people. Who else would be impacted by, by HB 50? Educators, exactly. Parents, teachers, and guess Any what? Any healthcare providers. Yes, any healthcare providers. And so that's kind of what I'm getting to as well. So when we take an OT look at it, uh, school-based OTs and PED slash adolescent mental health OTs are definitely going to be implicated. If you're in the schools and one of your students comes to you and says, hey, my pronouns are they, them, what happens when it, when the teacher or when their parent asks for an update on how they're doing or you're sitting in their IEP meeting? Do you use their she her even though your student has told you their pronouns are they them or what do you do will you get in trouble if maybe you're working on left to right reading orientation with a student and you hand them a book that's been banned and you didn't know that what do you what's going to happen to you what's going to happen to that license that you have so th these are real things that could happen to our school based OTs our adolescent um, psych, mental health OTs. What other practice areas do we think could be implicated by this bill? I see um, anyone providing evidence-based sexual education curriculum. Mm -hmm. Anyone who a student discloses being queer or trans too. And then what are the occupational injustices that are present? We have occupational alienation, deprivation, and apartheid, right? All because based off of sexual orientation, we're saying you're not allowed to talk about your pronouns. You're, if you say that you're queer, we're going to tell your parents whether you like it or not. As a teacher, as an OT, as an educator, as a social worker, anyone in those schools, if you talk about X, Y, and Z, then you will be brought before the Department of Education and have your license questioned, your teaching ability questioned, and your job will come into question, right? So these are the real life implications of these bills. Like it is happening. It's not hypothetical that things are, things are getting dark in Florida and beyond. The next is HB 1521. So this is called facility requirements based on sex. So this was signed into law May 17th, 2023 and went into effect the first of this month. Um, it makes it difficult or impossible for transgender Floridians to access appropriate restrooms, domestic violence shelters, correctional institutions, or other spaces that match their gender. And this is because under this law, um, any state facility, anything that receives state funding, um, anything like that has to have um, men's and women's bathrooms only. Um, under this bill, anyone whose appearance doesn't meet a stranger's expectation can be questioned about private areas of their bodies. Um, this bill will harm and embarrass many individuals who will be harassed because of their perceived gender presentation. Um, and it also effectively deputizes cisgender individuals as bathroom enforcers, tasking them with identifying and reported suspected transgender people for arrest and subsequent investigation. Um, so this really leaves transgender individuals at an increased risk of sexual harassment and violence, physical harassment, and incarceration. So under this law, I, do, I want to really highlight the most concerning part is that if you are in a bathroom in Florida, right, per this law that is, that is effective of the first of this month, if someone says, hey, 
you don't look like a woman. Why are you in here? Hey, you don't look like a man. Why are you in here? They have the right to call the authorities on you. They have the right to call the police. And in this, if you are not in the bathroom that matches your biological sex, then um, you uh, this can be punished as a second degree misdemeanor. So if someone thinks you are in the wrong bathroom, they have the right whether you're from Florida or not, if someone's like, you don't look like you belong in this bathroom, they have the right to corner you there and call the police and say they feel uncomfortable. This is the law. Um, you can have charges brought before you. So this could happen to anyone at any time in Florida based off of what they look like. It doesn't take a police officer to catch them in the act. Any lay person can say, I'm really uncomfortable with you in here. Um, and and here are some real world examples, right? Um, is that this was written before the bill went into law, but it essentially uh, talks about the harm in which trans people have suffered in bathrooms, in changing facilities, just trying to live their life and being questioned. Um, and speaking from a personal note, as a trans person, when I went to go use the bathroom in Missouri uh, at our conference at the expo, which, you know, AOTA is claiming they will be able to keep people safe at these different places, I was questioned about the bathroom that I was in, and I was cornered by uh, an employee of the, of the, of the conference center about which bathroom that I was in. So these are things that are really real, right? It happened to me at AOTA 2023. Um, and then heading into AOTA 2024 in Florida, in the current political climate, we can only see that it'll, that'll just get worse. So what are some populations that are impacted by this bill? Oops. So obviously LGBTQ plus people, but yes, Pamela, thank you. Everyone is impacted by this bill. One of the biggest unintended consequences is that there is a false belief that people can tell when a person is trans. This has led to cis individuals which cis just means that your gender identity assigned at birth matches your current gender identity, have been harassed by people attempting to kick them out by the bathroom. So if you're a cisgendered woman with a short haircut, someone might come up to you and be like, hey, you look like a man to me and you need to get out. And then you're going to be sitting there like, what are you, wait, what? So this, this is happening. This is, this is the unintended consequence, right? Is that now everyone is a suspect. Um, Megan said, I had a cis woman friend get confronted in a women's bathroom because they thought she wasn't a woman. It was unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. These are the things that, these are the things that are, are can, that can happen and will continue to happen. And yeah, androgynous and non-binary individuals um, with hirsutism, what does that mean? I would love to know more. And then hair suitism oh. is when um, you just grow more hair. Okay, cool. um, I was going to co-sign too that one of the unintended consequences of this for cis folks is that they're going to avoid like it's it's the consequence for trans folks and cis folks that fear being harassed in the restroom. They're going to avoid going and this. Now we're causing actual health concerns of people who aren't comfortable using the restroom, but are away from their homes or safe spaces for long periods of the day. So we're going to intake consumption of like food and, and water. And also like, it's just going to impact so many actual physical health concerns. Absolutely. You're 100% correct because in the event that I was in Florida, which I won't be, I absolutely would not, based off of what happened at this past conference, like there's no possible way I would use the, the bathroom at, at, a, at conference. I would be terrified. Um, I see Vanessa has their hand up. Yes, Vanessa. Um, I was going to just share kind of like, I know I saw a lot on the comments, like people's experiences. I've also had a friend. I'm, I'm currently here in Florida. And so my friend had gone to a Walmart and they went to the gendered bathroom that they um, identify with. So they went to the men's restroom and then Somebody confronted them in there saying, basically, get the hell out, trying to attack 
them. So they instead go over to the woman's restroom and then he follows and says, my wife is in there. There's no way I'm letting you freaking in there. But I just want to reiterate, even though there's a lot of hate here, that especially when it's in public spaces, like, for example, a Walmart or like a hotel, those aren't federally funded. And that's just an excuse for people to be bigots. So don't feel like you have to sit there and take it and wait for the police to show up. Because at that point, it's you and yourself. And you need to be able to step away and be like, I see your hate and I don't have to stand for it. Peace out. Absolutely. Peace and I, I do love that as a strategy, especially with support. Um, but we also do have to keep in mind that not only Florida, but America in general is also a gun happy place and a violence happy place. So I'm glad that your friend was able to get away safely. I'm sorry that they experienced that. But also some the fact that the other man was willing to follow them to a different bathroom is also terrifying, right? That in itself is violence. Why, why are you following me? Um, thank you for sharing. And yes, Josephine. Um, I just wanted to share just in like the intention from what I understand, like having a national conference is like a gathering space to disseminate accurate information based on the current developments and research within OT and occupational science. And just even if we did, I, AOT Aspire might have a hybrid option this year. I'm not sure, but just the implication of these laws and having scholars that are publishing accurate information about how to support trans individuals and queer individuals and gender expansive individuals. What are the implications that you're saying gay and saying queerness in a, like a formally published spot in this region that can follow you just for being a scholar that is implicating and, and what this does for stifling the flow of accurate and scientific information about how we properly and ethically care for our diverse patients. This really stifles our ability to have um, accurate, free-flowing freedom of speech information about how to medically and socially support this occupationally deprived demographic in the U.S. So it sort of stifles our ability to have the function of a conference. Absolutely. That very well said. And we'll also get to some of that when we get to our anti-DEI uh, education laws as well, because there is there is a full campaign against higher education currently, against it, especially OT as a profession, what we claim to believe and do. All of that is under attack right now in these Florida laws. Like, you're correct. There is, there is this push to not even let accurately accurate information scientifically accurate information come through lived experiences all of that there's there's definitely a campaign to limit that thank you um okay let's see what is next so we've got sb 254 so this is treatments for sex reassignment so again this is a really innocuously named bill um this was signed into law may 17th and went into effect july 1st so the biggest, 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 biggest thing about this bill is that it removes trans children from their homes if their parents provide them access to gender affir affirming care. I'm going to say that again. This bill, or sorry, law, it's a law as of 13 days, 11 days ago, removes trans children from their homes if their parents provide them access to gender affirming care. Uh, one of the big, like, in celebrity news, if any of you keep up with that, um, Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union actually moved from Florida because they have a trans daughter. And they said, well, if we stay here and we love her and we want her to grow into who she is, if we stay here, well, CPS is going to take away our daughter. So we got to go. And obviously they're multimillionaires, so they could afford to move and all of those things. But this is, this is a real concern for children and the parents of trans children. This also bans gender affirming medical care, such as puberty blockers or hormone therapy for transgender youth, and also enacts obstacles for adults to access treatment. Um, so this new law prohibits government agencies, including local municipalities and public colleges and universities, as well as Florida's Medicaid program from spending state money on gender affirming care. 
It requires licensed healthcare facilities to provide the state with a signed attestation claiming that the facility does not offer or provide sex reassignment prescriptions or procedures and does not refer such patients to other providers for such services. Um, and also the state has the power to revoke a facility's license if it fails to produce the attestation according to the new law. Um, so essentially, not only does it make it illegal for parents to uh, provide for gender affirming care to their children, it essentially defunds trans inclusive public health care um, and also makes illegal gender affirming care by providers, which also kind of continues to implicate us because we are health care providers, right? with a lot of these laws, and we'll see this real world implication where parents are really scared. They're scared for themselves, they're scared for their children. They're not sure what this is going to mean for, their, for the future. Um, and like I said, with OT, it also implicates us, right? So it implicates our LGBTQ plus populations with a specific focus on children. And also we have intersections of race and class here, right? Because it's defunding any type of trans inclusive health care for Medicaid recipients. Well, Medicaid recipients tend to are tend to be people from low SES backgrounds. Medicaid recipients also are uh, heavily represented uh, by, with Black populations, Latinx populations, disabled people often are on Medicaid. Um, and the, so those are the intersections that we have to look at. Um, and then what practice areas are impacted? So again, adolescent, psych, PED, school-based OTs, and then our standard mental health and psych practice. Um, yes, and actually, Josephine, to speak more about uh, autistic individuals, I couldn't find it, and I'll, I'll have to look more because I don't want to speak incorrectly, but there is added pressure to say that if you are diagnosed with autism, if you are autistic, it, that is actually a strike against you to be able to receive gender-affirming care. Um, they're, they're saying that autistic individuals are not able to make those decisions for themselves, um, which has been, you know, which is not true. So like we said, if you're working at a facility that accepts Medicaid, right, then you have to commit to not providing any gender affirming care. Because we know that these laws can be vague, what are other examples of Yes, and these bills are being proposed in multiple states, exactly. Um, I think Ohio is a big one. I currently teach in Wisconsin. They also have some pretty gnarly laws. Um, so here, gender affirming care, obviously there's uh, any like gender reassignment surgery, there are hormone and puberty blockers. Obviously us as OTs, we don't deal with any of that. But what are other ways as OTs that we do engage in gender affirming care? Yeah, dressing, exactly. What are other ways that we participate in gender affirming care? Body image issues, exactly. Just by using your client's pronouns that they want, like that's gender affirming care. So we are very much community participation, making community with other trans and queer folks, exactly. Social participation, occupational affirmation, post-surgical precautions. These are all ways that we as OTs could be implicated, but for providing gender affirming care. Um, I, you know, it's all over the place. So these are definitely populations. Uh, so in addition to what I have listed here, this looks like acute care. This looks like rehab being affected. It looks like, ooh, pelvic floor after surgery. Yes, Jess, that is pelvic floor OTs. We're implicated everywhere. So these are the laws. And again, thank you for everyone who's pointing out the different states and the different laws in the chat where this is happening as well. So not only are our patients and clients in danger, we're in danger as people who might hold these identities 
or as people who are supposed to respect these identities and want to provide the best quality care that we can, regardless of someone's gender identity, right? So this speaks to occupational apartheid, alienation, deprivation, and marginalization. So this is the impact of this law. All right. So then, like I said, we'll skip through some of these. Um, except for, I wanted to like briefly touch on this, uh, the protections of medical conscience. This went in, this was signed into law May 11th, went into effect July 1st. This allows healthcare providers and payers to refuse um, to provide health health services based off of their conscientious based objections. Um, the legislation defined conscientious based objection as based on a sincerely held religious, moral, or ethical belief. Um, and insurance companies could also refuse to pay for services if it goes against the written um, conscience-based guidelines. Um, this is important, obviously, in general, uh, that anyone can be denied uh, health care based off of their medical provider's uh, beliefs. Um, and also, this can be concerning because uh, as we talked to I've talked about this presentation with several people, uh, and one of the persons talked about how their friend had a medical emergency one year at an AOTA conference, and they had to go to a hospital to get checked out. That could happen to any of us at AOTA, right? Medical emergencies happen. So what then what happens if you're a queer person, a trans person, or maybe you're Black, maybe you're a Muslim, maybe you're what, maybe, 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 well, all of these identities. And if someone says, ah, yeah, no, it's a no for me, then that's that, right? So that is the law. Is that based off of any of my sincerely held beliefs, I can reject care for you. Maybe you're someone who I, I'm not trying to assume what people are doing at conference or in life. Maybe you need to go and buy, go get your birth control refilled at a pharmacy locally. Maybe you need the plan B pill. This is something that your pharmacist could say, actually, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell this to you. So these are what these laws can look like for people day to day. Ooh, yes. Who said this? Josephine, this is how contemporary eugenics functions. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So that's what this can look like. Um, and like I said, all of this information will be are in here. Uh, this is another law that went into effect July 1st, uh, HB 1069, which just says education. Um, if anyone's heard of like the book ban in Florida, um, oh, yep, if someone has a miscarriage, exactly. Um, sorry, if anyone has heard of like, oh, they're banning books in Florida, this is the law that they are referring to. Um, and it just essentially, uh, provides that districts, school boards are responsible for materials used in classroom libraries. Um, so this set up a really big scrutiny of classroom materials. So an example that you can see here is Amanda Gorman. She is, I don't know if she's still the National Poet Laureate, but she did a poem at Joe Biden's inauguration called The Hill We Climb. Um, a link to that is in the is in the resource guide. It was a very beautiful poem. One parent submitted a complaint. Um, first of all, she listed the author as Oprah Winfrey. So like not even aware of who, who has written this book or what's going on. Um, and then the book was removed from all Florida, all Florida public schools. So it also only takes one parental complaint for these bans to come into place. Um, all right. Let's go, I'll speed through some of these. So I skipped through some, but again, you all have access to this. I wanted to get to some of these other laws. So we have SB 718, which speaks to immigration. Um, so this in Florida, it's saying that private employers with 25 or more employees must use the federal e-verify system to verify a new employee's eligibility. Um, and I don't know if any of you have applied for a job recently, but on every job education application, it says, you know, are you legally allowed to work in the U.S.? Um, and if you have to click either, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen or like, yes, I have my green card or no. So they're saying every single employee in Florida 
has to go through this e-verify system um, to make sure, you know, to make sure there is no one who shouldn't be here is kind of what Florida is saying. Um, under this law, out-of-state driver's license issued to unauthorized immigrants are no longer valid. So Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Rhode Island, and Vermont are all states that provide licenses for people who may be un um, who may be undocumented and undocumented immigrant so that they can live, laugh, love in their lives, right? So if this really speaks to um, a lot of populations, um, actually, we'll talk that about that in the next slide. But so, yeah, so these driver licenses are no longer valid from Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Vermont. And these are for people who specifically have licenses um, that state that, you know, they are not like a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. Um, also, hospitals must ask patients about their legal status. So any hospital that accepts Medicaid must include a provision on its patient admission or registration forms for the patient or the patient's representative to indicate whether the patient is a U.S. citizen lawfully present in the United States or not lawfully present in the United States. Hospitals would then need to turn the data over to the governor and the Florida legislature quarterly and annually. So any hospital that accepts Medicaid has to, before you can render any care, you first have to ask, what's your, what's your legal status in this country? So that's pretty messed up. So obviously in Florida, who are the populations impacted? Well, Florida has a large Latino population. Um, and uh, so that is speaking specifically to Florida, very impacted by this bill. Um, general, just the immigrant communities and DACA recipients, right? So this implicates OT students. We have OT students who are DACA students and DACA recipients. So currently as is, they wouldn't even be allowed to travel to Florida safely or with any identification that's recognized. And if for any reason they are profiled or followed or someone calls the police on someone, it's it's straight to ICE detention, right? So that's something that is very scary for us. What are some other populations impacted or which practice areas do we think are implicated and why? What do we, what do we think about? SB 1718 on immigration. It, yeah, so anyone from those states, so anyone from those states can come. Those states specifically are five states that provide government issued identification to people who may not be, um, who might have an undocumented status legally. Um, but what it might lead to, and this is a huge concern of the bill in general, is that it could open the floodgates of racial profiling, right? Maybe we're now we're just stopping anyone who's Latino, Latina, Latinx and being like, oh, show me your ID. Do you belong here? That is the reality of what this bill can look like. Um, and then just as Puerto Ricans are now more than ever being targeted by immigration because no one realizes we are citizens and we get sent to ICE until things get sorted out, which is ridiculous. Yes, just I just read something like the other week about this man with his license from Puerto Rico who got detained because there's just really no understanding that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens, um, which is outrageous. So this is, yeah, this also impacts any OTPs and students coming from Puerto Rico to participate in conference, right? So not only does this harm current Floridians, but also people who may come to Florida. Okay. Then we have, speaking back to, I think, Josephine, what you were saying about what's going on with higher education. So um, SB 266 is just called higher education. And like I said, again, these bills are very innocuously named. So if you're not paying attention, you wouldn't understand what has happened with the passing of this. This bill defunds all state-funded DEI education in Florida. 
So I'm going to say that again. This bill defunds all state-funded DEI education in Florida. So this went into effect officially July 1st, right? So any DEI education is no longer supported in Florida. I want to start by saying that we have, I think, as far as publicly funded OT schools in Florida, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there are five, five OT programs at state schools. And of those five programs, one is an HBCU at FAMU. And HBCU is a historically Black college and university. So there are more Black students at FAMU in their OT program than you would see in any any other OT program, aside from, I think Howard also has an OT program and they're an HBCU. So anything related to DEI has been defunded in our states. So that means our students are at risk, right? Our students that are at risk about what they're allowed to learn about, what they can talk about, what their research interests can be, if their identities are even allowed to be affirmed in the classroom or talked about. And then our educators, are also at risk, right? Because what can I teach? What can I say? How do I talk about social determinants of health? How do I talk about culturally responsive care? How do I talk about any of that? All of that is DEI. Um, how do we meet our goals of increasing POC enrollment into OT programs in Florida? Like that's DEI. So all of the things that we want to accomplish as OTs, this is all now illegal. Um, it also prohibits the state's public colleges um, and universities from sending, spending state or federal money on programs or campus activities that advocate for DEI. Um, and again, this is this is spreading like hotcakes. So Ohio has also introduced a bill similar to this. Um, if someone can drop it in the chat, I would love that. And then Wisconsin, where I teach, uh, they just eliminated $38 million from our public universities um, of funding for DEI. So the funding is being cut left, right, and center all across the United States for DEI education. Um, it also, for higher education, this bill dictates what courses of study college students could choose to pursue and prohibits fields of study involving race and gender studies. So I'm gonna say that again, dictates what courses of study college students could choose to pursue and prohibits fields of study involving race and gender studies. So it is just not allowed at this point. It also usurps faculty hiring decisions to the governor's appointees and allows tenure to be reviewed at any time. So for any hiring decision, tenure positions, any of that, once a professor puts together their tenure package going up for it, it goes through the channels that it typically would at a university. But then if the governor wants to, him and his appointees can come in and be like, yeah, no, no tenure for you. Um, there was recently, and we'll see it in the in the next slide, or maybe it's in a different one. But anyway, there were recently five uh, professors in Florida were all denied their tenure from the government. So it wasn't that their school denied them; it's that uh, this this appointee group denied them. It also prohibits spending on activities that promote DEI and creates new general education requirements, prioritizing neoclassical education focused on Western European civilization. So, and uh, DeSantis is quoted as saying, we are eliminating the DEI programs. We're going to treat people as individuals. So that is, that is the full hope of these programs are to, to, to eliminate DEI um, from existence. So, um, so yeah, SB 266 here uh, is very controversial law. This screen grab here shows students, faculty, staff of various Florida universities protesting um, protesting this, this law because it, it's really outrageous. Um, and let's see. Okay, and the specific 
type of courses that uh, would be barred from existing would be things like theories uh, that talk about systemic racism, sexism, or oppression, um, and, in privilege, and privilege being inherent to the U.S. institution, right? Education like that would be illegal. Um, and then also other subjects like critical race theory, um, critical um, disability theory, gender studies, feminist studies, all of those, uh, all of those other study areas would, would really be defunded um, because they speak to these DEI principles. Um, so this impacts Black people, Indigenous people, POCs, LGBTQ plus people, and it impacts us all, right? So how does this impact us all? Yes, Josephine. Um, uh, the focus of a lot of my work over the past few years is trying to help translate um, insights of occupational science to field clinicians. So this definitely impacts me directly. And part of why I've made that a focus of my work is that the occupational therapy practice framework now incorporates many of the developments of ocu international occupational science in our regulatory framework for all traditional and emerging practice settings across all 50 states. So this literally would affect all of our practice settings if we are aspiring to be in compliance with our science-based and our regulations. So I can't imagine a single occupational therapy practice setting, especially if we're serious about Vision 2025, we're supposed to be working on diversity, equity, inclusion in all 50 states and our practices. So we really wouldn't be in alignment with any of our commitments, which is hard because if we don't have our word, I don't know what we have. I don't really know what laws that occupational therapy practitioners in the US are going to decide to care about and if we want them to be in alignment with values and human rights um, as yeah. well. I think it really affects um, every human and occupational being across the globe. And I hope that people think occupational science is a real fruitful discipline that can influence how we understand what humans need to thrive in context. So I don't think we should throw that away. Absolutely. I think what you're saying is spot on. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it also, I also like that you brought up the fact that as general inherently to OT that we are, you know, AOTA Vision 2025 is saying that we want to focus on DEI in all 50 states, et cetera, et cetera. This also brings up the question of, okay, if AOTA says this, um, why haven't we heard anything, right? This is this has happened. This is happening. This is happening to our OTPs in Florida. This is happening to our students in Florida. This is happening to our patients, populations, and clients that we serve. This is something that I would expect AOT PAC to come forward and say something about the laws, right? If you purport to want to support OT through political endeavors, then it is very chilling that our political action committee has been silent on laws that are devastating communities across the country. Um, so yeah, I do, I agree with you that it would be pretty hypocritical if, if there isn't some movement or change. Um, SB 999 is the post-secondary educational institutions. Um, so this proposed bill mandates a curriculum that promotes citizenship in a constitutional republic, um, and the vagueness of which could promote questionable requirements for instructional content in numerous areas. Um, this also says if the government doesn't agree with what you teach, i.e. DEI, then you could be denied tenure or fired from your job. And then it explicitly dictates that the university must, quote, remove from its programs any major or minor that is based on or otherwise utilizes pedagogical methodology associated with critical theory, including but not limited to critical race theory, critical race studies, critical ethnic studies, Radical, radical feminist theory, radical gender theory, queer theory, critical social justice or intersectionality as defined in Board of Governors regulation or any other major or minor that includes a curriculum that promotes um, concepts that are listed in a larger document. So again, explicitly dictates that we must remove critical race theory, critical race studies, ethnic studies, radical feminist theory, radical gender theory, queer theory, critical social justice, or intersectionality, which these are all things that we would hope our students are 
<laughs> learning in the classroom, right? These are all topics. And I, so I have given the same presentation to my students as well. And we talked about it. I said, the, the lectures that I give you all, I, under this law, if we were in Florida, I could easily be arrested for what I'm teaching. I could easily have my position removed um, for what I'm teaching. And that is, that's also going to be a huge detriment, again, to all people um, in all areas. So this is what I was for referring to uh, before. So at New College of Florida, uh, the, the trustees denied tenure for five faculty. Um, So the way that it works is that each state university board of trustees is responsible for hiring full-time faculty for the university. Then the president of the university may provide hiring recommendations to the board. The president and the board are not required to consider recommendations or opinions of faculty of the university. So this is how the decision making is being made. So it is now out of the hands of the people who are actually learning from the professor or the people who are working with the professor. It is all in the hands of the government of if you get tenure or not, what you can learn or not, or not. Um, and Lauren said, as someone who has incorporated queer theory into my dissertation and who teaches about this, CRT and feminist theory in my teaching, I literally could not exist in my role as a PhD student and teacher in Florida. Um, and Mary Alexander said, the governor of Florida wants to ban divine nine sororities and fraternities on college campuses, another occupational injustice to students of color, which yes, thank you for bringing that up. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, divine nine sororities and fraternities are historically black uh, sororities and fraternities that celebrate um, and uplift black culture and black people. It's obviously not exclusive to black people joining these organizations, but it has historical roots in blackness. Um, so that is awful. Vanessa says, it baffles me how corrupt our politicians treat diversity, equity, or inclusion as a dirty word. Exactly. And yes, the First Amendment does protect against some of this, but our, as you can see, our court system is also very compromised right now. Um, look at any of the rulings that have come out of in the past few weeks. Um, and then Taylor said, as a student myself, I cannot fathom how my education would be impacted by these laws, right? Because the, all the things that we're supposed to be talking as OTs and all the considerations that we want to be making for our students would be illegal to talk about. And is now it is actively not legal to be spoken about in Florida. So our students and our faculty and educators and OTPs all in Florida right now really need our eyes and ears on this matter, right? We can't just leave them hanging uh, because one, that's just wrong. And two, it's coming for all of us, right? These laws are coming for all of us. And so we can't just not look at what's going on. Carrie says, this also impacts any clients we ever serve and our colleagues because we have grossly dehumanized so many people with all these laws. After hearing one law alone, how is practicing as an OT in the US not requiring us all to look at the occupational injustice to support each other in all the states we serve in, no matter what area we serve. This is the context in which all humans are attempting to engage in occupations. And no matter what state we practice in, it impacts us all. I don't want to derail the flow of the conversation, so this is probably for later, but how can we possibly still have conferences in these states with such insufficient safety? Um, and yes, this will we're actually coming up to it right about now. Um, yes, Liz, your hands up. Hey, I also just wanted to say that like it's it's amazing to me just like how it's not even just laws, but a lot of it is like a programs, um, what am I trying to say? A programs culture that influences how um open people can be I I was closeted through my first year of OT school I went to OT school in Texas um I heard a lot of phrases from my professors such as this might not be politically correct but and then go on to say like a conservative viewpoint whether it's anti-abortion or saying that someone couldn't use they them pronouns to describe an individual in their um profile occupations or their occupational profiles. Um, so I was afraid of being like Dr. Points or targeted by certain professors. Um, so it makes me worried that these laws might make these professors feel emboldened 
um, <laughs> to yeah. to it in in supported in these ways and to see AOTA just kind of like further ignore um, this um, it just you know it makes me you know it makes me scared for the future but like you know I just wanted to kind of point that out just like how culturally there's so much that. I hope I made a point. <laughs> you made but, an excellent point, Liz. <laughs> thank you so you much. Made an excellent point, and thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna not only harm people who care about uh, these topics. Not it's gonna harm people who have lived experience. But like you said, it's gonna embolden people who are like, heck yeah, we shouldn't be using they them pronouns, and women shouldn't have the right to choose, and people pregnant people shouldn't have the right to that and actually no kids yeah you're exactly right and these are the realities of uh underrepresented students and underrepresented faculty and staff and uh now right this is the, this is the reality of of not only am i already being discriminated against um, now this discrimination is legal um yes josephine um, I just wanted to comment. On, I I noticed that some of the folks from marginalized OT status too on social media commenting about kind of like the sorrow that comes from the Supreme Court counting down the student loan forgiveness um, bill, which AOTA did make a statement of. So I want to acknowledge that that was like a really good constructive action in solidarity with um, the uh, academic exclusionary parts of um academia functions differently in the U.S. and other countries, making it uniquely inaccessible to, you know, Vision 25 in part is trying to increase the diversity of our um, OT access to OT education, not just by demographics, but also by disability status. And so uh, I guess there's just, I wanted to add that additional context of the political unfolding that students and minoritized students are continuing to get hit after hit, discouraging from ever getting a therapy career. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And just afford student loans, which student loans are a huge factor in not being able to afford to access conference. So we don't really have, um, we're not investing the capacity of young clinicians, which I just saw some research too, that younger clinicians in their first 10 years, and especially for minoritized backgrounds are of a highly higher likelihood, like 22 or like 34% or something of working in hostile work environments in the OT profession. Um, so really students need our like really grounded supports and we're not really building to have a future capacity for recruiting OT, OTs. I'm genuinely worried that we might not have um, OT services for many elders in my community and especially in these other states. You know, it's federal Medicaid and Medicare is often a federal right to access these medically necessary services if they're ordered by a provider. But if these environments are too hostile or you can't afford to work in these environments, then it trickles down that our elders are not getting the care that they need to a safely age in place. And that ends up costing all of us as kept taxpayers money because when people don't get their medical needs met they cost more from the state um so it's all connected all of these decisions not investing in young people and dei initiatives oh absolutely thank you for saying that and not only that um again i will as a side note the resource guide that i provided in the google doc this will be a living resource folder so i will um we will continue to update it as well. Um, it also speaks to the fact that if you also look at the data and the science is that people from minoritized backgrounds have better health outcomes when they are served by minoritized practitioners, right? That's the science. At the end of the day, there are poor health outcomes for people from underrepresented backgrounds while they're treated by white practitioners. And so we also have to think about that. If we make it harder for people to get into the profession, it's also going to, it's just so many effects everywhere. I will say to AOTA's point, while they did make a statement, and we'll talk about this soon, is from our national organization, if you look at their history, they AOTA loves making statements, but a statement means nothing when you are continuing to do things that harm people, uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds, when you continue to ignore uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds saying that this isn't enough. So AOTA, I'm sorry, at the end of the day, they're in a national organization. So like a statement isn't really doing anything and they're aware of that, right? And that's why we have to take some stronger actions because AOTA isn't 
aren't listening. They're not really taking this as seriously as it is because what we're experiencing right now as a country, for many people, these are this is a life and death situation. So it's like, I'm going to need a little bit more than a statement um, <laughs> for that. So. Oh, no. can I say, oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. I, I, um, part of it, I work in elder care too. And some of these things are like federally funded by Medicare. So if you think about it, when you're helping your clients learn to do their ADLs and you happen to have a trans client or that, you know, trans clients also have the same, you know, human and federal rights in theory, I guess, but like this also impacts not in a school environment, right? Like you can also have a trans client next to somebody that maybe is more bigoted too. And like balancing those out, like in our traditional settings, this is going to cause, you know, mass, like, uh, I guess I just, I hadn't heard that come up the traditional medical context that we work in. Like I work in SNF, for example. So yeah. Toilet <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's going to be ever. Yes. So all, honestly, all practice areas, thank you for bringing that up. So not just psych or peds, it's acute, it's sniffs, it's, it's prison, it's everywhere OTs work. These are going to be the issues that are coming up because there are LGBTQ plus individuals are everywhere. Black people are everywhere. Latin people, Latino people are everywhere, right? Uh, people from low SES backgrounds are everywhere. So because we are everywhere, this is going to impact every single last setting. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and also bringing up the context of skilled nursing facilities. Um, shout out to everyone who works in a sniff. You're really doing the Lord's work. Um, okay. The last law that we will look at here is HB7, which is individual freedom. This is known as the stop woke bill. I, I still haven't heard any Republican firmly define what woke means. I don't, I don't know what woke means, but this is the stop woke bill. Um, and it essentially revises the requirements for required instruction on the history of African Americans. So um, this bill requires that African American history instruction is developed in in students. Um, they to to let students know the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping on individual freedoms, and examine what it means to be responsible and respectful person for the purpose of encouraging tolerance of diversity for nurturing and protecting democratic values and institution. So essentially this bill is saying we gotta water down the black history. Um, so for example, this just happened. Um, the, the one teacher was teaching about the Tulsa race massacre. And they said that you're allowed to teach about it, but you're not allowed to say that this occurred due to race or racism. So it's it's just really making sure that um, this is just kind of legalized white fragility protection of, hey, we can't talk about the history of black people. So this is a really, really, really disturbing bill, right? So this is, Again, this is one specific population, the Black population saying, your history is not allowed here. We are not teaching that. We, we can't talk about that. So I want you all to let's just really sit with that, of saying, you're Black and we don't care. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear about your life. We don't want to hear about your history. So that's what's happening. And this, it, this is through K through 12 education and also higher education. Um, so this really, I think this is wrong. This impacts a ton of populations, right? But specifically black population. Um, and it implicates all of us, right? To say that here are, here's a history that you're not even allowed to learn about. You're not allowed to talk about unless you present it in a very gentle, nice, delicate way that makes everyone look nice. Um, and so this is, is, it's a huge concern. So these are a lot of these bills. And so far, and this is just, again, a little snippet, more is in the resource guide. Here are the impacts of the Florida law so far. So looking at um, LGBTQ plus people, ABC News did a report that describes these anti-LGBTQ laws as 
genocidal um, and that people are fleeing the, fleeing the states. We also see that there is an internal refugee crisis to 130, 130 to 260,000 trans people have fled a state, not specifically Florida, but different states and are trying to get free and be safe. Yes, Josephine. I just think one of the contextual pieces that hasn't been stated yet is the risk of suicidal ideation of young people in particular and just queer and trans humans in general. Absolutely. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes. What is it like to exist in a world that says that you don't matter, right? That would mess with your head. That's going to mess with your mental, emotional health. That's going to be LGBTQ plus people. This is going to put pressure on more in Florida specifically, but beyond looking at um, the Latinx population, looking at Black populations. Yeah, like this is an injustice in itself, is the mental stress of your identity, who you are to your core is illegal, right? That's a lot to sit with. Who you are is illegal. Who you are is punishable by prison or by jail time. Who you are is now legally being opened up to violence. And that's terrifying. Yeah, that's going to lead to terrible mental health outcomes. So we've gone through all these laws. We've agreed that, okay, things are looking very ugly in Florida and beyond. Sounds dangerous, right? AOTA is going to cancel the conference. And so AOTA posted their own FAQs. Again, access to those frequently asked questions relating to AOTA Inspire are what are available in that resource guide. Um, and within there, these answers here copied and pasted exactly. I did not change any of the words from AOTA. So AOTA responds that no, they will not relocate AOTA Aspire 2024. Uh, they say there are limited venues in the nation that are large enough to accommodate our conference, which are booked years in advance and have decreased capacity in 2024 due to pent up demand. Additionally, Orlando would penalize AOTA and its member with a $2 million cancellation fee and a cancellation would impact workers in the service industry who are employed for large scale conferences. So this response to me, and now I'm officially in the opinion portion of tonight, is this says, <laughs> yeah, this is the same exact energy of you can stay home if you want. Exactly. So don't be fooled. AOTA, for what I got from this is, oh, you're not canceling because you, you have chosen $2 million over the lives of LGBTQ plus individuals, over the lives of DACA recipients, over the lives of Black people, over the lives of, uh, of Black people, over the lives of children, over the lives of women, over, yeah, our money is more important than your safety. This is what this statement is. Um, and not only that, try to like, throw service workers under the bus like okay if we cancel they wouldn't get paid and like this is this is this is not about service workers right because if this was about service workers you wouldn't have put that part about the two million dollar cancellation fees and this is no shade to service workers um love y'all <laughs> but it's just like that this is not why you're not canceling so okay fine um yeah this is Exactly. It's your money and it's your dues funding this conference. And also conference in itself is obviously cost prohibited. I think it's about like $400 to register. And then depending where you live, it can be anywhere between zero to like $500 to get there. And then you have to find somewhere to stay and then you have to pay for your own food. So then you're going to do all of that to get there just to be harassed, potentially. I don't know about me. I wouldn't do it. So here are some conferences in the news. And again, these are all going to be within that document. So there are plenty of other organizations that are canceling their conferences in Florida because of the hostile action. These groups range from teaching groups to um, coding programs. Um, a nursing group has pulled out from hosting their conference in Florida. The Society of Black Engineers have pulled out from um, having their conference in 
Florida due to the attacks on DEI and on LGBTQ plus people, um, and also based off of reproductive rights and all of the things that we've talked about today. So actually, canceling is possible, um, where AOTA is choosing not to. So it's like, okay, well, since they're having a conference, AOTA has a safety plan, right? If we're if they're determined to do this, there must be a safety plan, right? So AOTA says we're committed to creating a welcoming, inclusive conference in person in Orlando and on demand online. AOTA upholds OT's commitment to DEI um, and the Representation Assembly's policies affirming gender diversity and affirming sexual orientation. The city of Orlando has received a perfect score for the Human Rights Campaign um, Equality Index for nine consecutive years based off of how inclusive their municipal laws, policies, and services of, are of LGBTQ plus residents and advisors. Attendees will be welcome to use the restroom that matches their gender identity, and all AOTA event participants are expected to treat others with respect and follow the AOTA event code of conduct. So that's the safety plan, is that they're committed to upholding their commitment to DEI and to affirming gender diversity and sexual orientation, that, and that anyone can use any bathroom that they want. And the human rights campaign gave Orlando an excellent score in equality. Mind you, this is the same exact human rights campaign that put out the travel advisory for LGBTQ plus individuals not to come to Florida, right? Um, Oh my God, $2,000. Goodness, Tracy. Yeah, conferences, too much money. So, okay, fine. This is their safety plan, right? Let's take a closer look at the resources that they have cited in their own statement. So AOTA's commitment to DEI. There, these are some of the portions that I selected to kind of really focus on. In AOTA's commitment to DI document, which again is provided for you in the resource guide, it says forms of diversity should be respected and valued in line with the principles defined and described in the Occupational Therapies Code of Ethics. Non-discrimination is a necessary prerequisite for inclusion. So that's AOTA's own word. For inclusion to happen, then non-discrimination cannot be present. Hmm. Interesting. It also says the relevance of political or institutional context has far reaching implications for all individuals, especially marginalized groups who are not afforded the same rights and access to resources as the majority of society. In turn, these factors can significantly affect occupational opportunities and result in occupational injustice. The occupational therapy profession has a vested interest in addressing occupational injustice. So, so far, do we feel like we're in line with AOTA's commitment to, dive, to DEI? Do, does, does conference in Florida feel like it's upholding that commitment that they reference themselves in their own statement? Exactly, Joanna, the math isn't mathing, it isn't adding up, right? So if this is what your commitment is, if this is what you're saying that you're committed to, your own words in your own documents of your own FAQ is saying that non-discrimination is a prerequisite to inclusion and that we have a vested interest in addressing occupational injustice. Have we seen that? No, what we got was a statement saying, too bad, we're having conference here anyway. I need someone to tell me, how does that address occupational justice? Yes, Josephine. Well, I, um, I'm i just gonna paraphrase. I did read some of the work that was distributed by the COTAD group and that part, there was feedback from community stakeholders within the Florida territory that requested that, um, that, that leaving might not be one of the ways to best be an allyship, that there's also an interest of stakeholders that can't leave Florida of wanting us to show up in allyship and advocate for their rights. So I just wanted to reflect that there are some voices that are impacted by these laws that don't want um, like cancellation of the con con uh, conference to be the only action. So I just wanna direct people towards statements from stakeholders within that community of some of the requests for allyship. I'm just saying that because I'm a cis and um, heterosexual person. So I try to make sure that I listen to those direct requests as well, that there's more nuance than just leaving as being, uh, sometimes just pulling resources out isn't also enough to address justice issues. 
Okay. And not to put you on the spot and not saying that we also for diverse OT, both diverse OT national and diverse OT Chicago collective also spoke to stakeholders, right? It's a large, the LGBTQ plus community is a large community. Um, the black community is a large community. The Latino community is a large community. So these are all large communities. The question is AOTA's commitment. They're saying, they said, non-discrimination is a necessary prerequisite to inclusion and that we have a vested interest in addressing occupational injustice. The question was, what has AOTA done to address occupational injustice in relation to this conference? Totally. Those actions. I'm sorry. I missed her too. And I'm also new to this body of work. Thank you for the opportunity to join. I wasn't aware of the diverse OT community before this. So thank you. Yes. No worries. Yeah. And we'll, I'll also pull, um, pull that up as well, um, because we heard back from a lot of OTs who are scared and don't want to go. Um, and I can understand why stakeholders in Florida want us to show up for them. And I think there are plenty of ways that we can support people in Florida, right? But I'm not going to tell another queer person, like, you need to go to Florida, and we need to be there and, and show up and what? get harassed, get arrested, be harmed ourselves. So it is, it is, there is nuance. And that's why I'm hosting this meeting today is I'm not saying let's just leave them alone, but how is giving the government of Florida our money helping anything change? If anything, I'd rather see AOTA cancel conference and donate that money to the programs in Florida. I would rather see AOTA cancel conference and give that money to DEI scholarships. Like, showing up isn't, that's not radical. That's just us showing up and giving the people who harm us our money. The money, if we show up, isn't going to help people from marginalized backgrounds. That's, that's the truth of it, right? If my money, if I knew that showing up to Florida, my money would go to people impacted. Thank you so much, Laura. So putting in the comments here, the different, the different, uh, opinions that people have from various backgrounds on not wanting to go to conference. Thank you so much. And I think we have like, ah, perfect. The next is looking at affirming sexual orientation. So this is another one of the documents that they put into their statement that they AOTA is claiming that they affirm. So occupational therapy practitioners and students should be aware of organizational, local, state, and national laws and policies, or lack thereof, that may not provide explicit legal or non-discrimination protections for sexual minority individuals. The lack of policies or legal protections may limit the ability to report instances of bias, harm, and human rights violations, right? So they're telling us that we need to be aware of local, state, and national laws and policies. Um, and we are, right? That's what we're doing here today. And so then it says, AOTA advocate, advocates against policies with negative impacts on sexual minorities, including, but not limited to, restrictions to healthcare decision-making and information sharing, employee benefits, and adoption policies for individuals and their parents or spouses. It also says that AOTA advocates against systemic barriers to healthcare utilization by sexual minority individuals. Have we seen any of this advocacy by AOTA at large? Right, we just talk about policies that impact sexual minorities, AKA people from LGBTQ plus backgrounds. We talked about how doctors and healthcare practitioners can do conscientious based objection to healthcare. That's gonna impact LGBTQ plus individuals. Uh, we talked about um, how if LGBTQ plus individuals, uh, children come out to their teacher or their social worker, their OT, that person has to then report that to their parent or to the school. These are, these are all systemic barriers. So what advocacy have we seen from AOTA that supports this? And then also, although AOTA and AOTPAC are two different organizations, which I acknowledge, how is AOTPAC, which is in conversation with AOTA, funding politicians who are passing these laws that support these laws, how is that advocating against these policies, right? And I'll let y'all sit with that one, but how, what is, how how could how could showing up and having this conference 
a conference which largely a lot of people have been speaking out against. How is, how is this in learning with their affirming sexual orientation? And then affirming gender diversity and identity. It says occupational therapy students or occupational therapy practitioners, students and educators have a duty, right? Have a duty, bold, underline, underscore this. This is directly from AOTA to advocate against policies with negative impacts on di gender diversity, including, but not limited to, bathroom bills intended to restrict access for transgender people, forbidding athletes from playing sports or sports teams consistent with their gender identity and restrictions to healthcare services. We also have the duty to advocate against systemic barriers to healthcare utilization by gender expansive individuals and have the duty to advocate against the practice of conversion therapy and other efforts to change gender diverse individuals' gender identity. So this is per AOTA in their own safety plan, in their own document, saying it. it is our duty to advocate against. So this meeting here right now, that's in line with what AOTA is asking us for. Us protesting this conference, letting our voices be heard to AOTA, we're doing what they said that we should be doing. Um, so I'm going to take a moment and leave it to y'all for the next minute or two. Tell me in the chat, how do you, how does this feel having this information of kind of what AOTA says we believe versus what's happening? And yes, Michelle, I see your hands up. Um, I just wanted to say that this has been an amazing presentation. I want to thank you for everything that you have shared with us. And um, I feel like we have a huge opportunity here to make a big difference. If AOTA and all of our OTPs could really get behind this, we can make a big stand against these laws in Florida. Now, I don't wanna put anybody in danger, so I'm not saying everybody should go and put themselves, subject themselves to these laws and um, these discriminations, but the teachers around the United States just held the Freedom to Learn Conference in Florida and had like a whole week of protests and building book boxes so that they can put little libraries around schools with banned books in them. And they're huge, they're much bigger than we are. But I just feel like this is when AOTA should be standing up and saying, hey, we will have our conference in Florida, but we will be super, extremely public about our views and how these populations are getting marginalized. This is not the time for them to step down and say, you guys are safe within our conference center. We'll protect you here. Don't walk outside the hotel though, because you won't be safe. This is when we need to stand up and say, we are here, we are loud, and we are going to let you know what we really think about these laws. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with the group. I agree, Michelle, right? I, I agree. If I would love to see, well, I would love to see generally this conference being canceled. That's my personal position, but we don't all have to share that. But I agree, since they are determined to continue on with the conference, where is the loud advocacy? And why have they left it to the marginalized OTPs and students to be doing this? AOTA, our national board, and AOTA PAC national board should be out in front, the loudest of us saying, this is not okay, this is, and none of that has happened, right? There has been no plan for how do we support our OTPs and students that are already in Florida, right? AOTA needs to be talking about that regardless of conference. These laws have taken effect in Florida. You need to tell us what you're doing for OTPs and students in there. Exactly what you said, like, what is the plan to do some type of resistive action, right? And there is this weird thing within OT in general where it's like, but we're not political. And it's like, no, everything's political. Everything's political. The fact that learning about blackness is now illegal lets you know that everything's political. And yes, Adrian said, unfortunately, there are some OTs who also support the exclusion and discrimination. Um, I'm hypothesizing that we see in action because AOTA must also support OTPs who agree with these exclusionary laws, which I agree with you about why we're seeing some waffling. Um, but also it's like, 
it, it, that that just makes me nervous for the future of OT, right? Things are only going to get uglier before they get better. And so it's kind of nerve wracking, like knowing that your organization isn't going to be there to have your back. Um, I feel like AOTA uses the royal we, relying on OTPs and students to do the work. Exactly. Like, this is why we have a national organization, yeah? Like, truly, AOTA should be the ones organizing all of these things. So far, it has been us, Diverse OT National, Diverse OT Collective, and COTAD have been the three organizations that I have seen out front. And that's not to say no one else is doing anything. If you are, please drop it in the chat. We'd love to connect. But at the end of the day, AOTA, where are you? Where are you? And not just statements for which your statements are also being contradicted by their actions. Um, and then Liz said, after the fall, the silencing of people at the last conference, I do wonder if the location choice was intentional to further silence and bar people. Yeah. Um, but Tracy says the location was set two years ago. Not likely intentional. Locations are set out to 2026, which thank you, Tracy, for that um, understanding. But I also would like to say, if you look at Florida politics two years ago, it was also terrible. That's another thing that I want us to understand. Like, yes, currently our political climate is kind of dicey and choppy, not kind of, is extremely dicey and choppy. Also, it has been like this. So it's, it's been bad. And so even two years ago, it's like, why would you, why is that the decision? So like we said, AOTA could have canceled the conference, move it to a different state, host it virtually only. Instead, we saw a double down, ignored concerns of LGBT plus, Black, Latinx, Muslim, immigrant, DACA recipient, OTPs, and students, disregarded their own policies, procedures, and code of ethics, and have decided $2 million is more valuable than the lives of OTPs, students, clients, and the populations we serve from oppressed and underrepresented backgrounds. Yes, Josephine. Um, I just want to, I, this might seem like a bit of a tangent, but just to kind of bring back another um, intersection that's of meaning and thinking about an association and a representative body and what it means that as a profession, since um, our founding and before our founding, we've largely allied ourselves with folks that are marginalized from being mentally unwell, unwell um, physically disabled and socially isolated. Um, I do think that there's a fundamental a question about what it means to host in-person federal conferences that are often fundamentally inaccessible to people with disabilities in the United States, where there are also laws that limit your ability to earn funds without putting your medical safety fundamentally at risk. Um, so I'm always an advocate for diverse um, ways of gathering and assembling. And I just looked up, it looks like I don't know, and Brent might have accurate information on this. It looks like AOTA is currently representing maybe about 30% of the total OTPs in the United States context. And so I think looking at what does it mean to represent all OTs in the United States and where we're creating spaces to share information and together, and can we aspire to be in integrity with the nothing about us without us, and what it means that people with disabilities fundamentally can't really access our conference structure as it currently is. And maybe if we might want to imagine new and ethical ways to generate funds to represent the interests of OTPs across all 50 states, I think there are fundamental questions that we need to ask about accessibility and gathering and informing policies um, organically in more of a grassroots approach than a hierarchy, hierarchical top-down approach, which we know by our science base doesn't deliver the best outcomes for occupational well-beings and human rights across the globe. And I hope that everybody here also considers looking at WFOT and their commitments to human rights and how the U.S. could join our international colleagues in being ambassadors for occupational justice, not only within our own borders, but in an internationally connected society. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josephine. If you have any like links or anything so people can learn more about WFOT and the international OT community, I would love if you could share that. And I agree with you um, in general, AOTA conference, and this is not specific to AOTA conference, this is a lot of academia and professional, but I think especially kind of 
baffling because we allege we're a profession about accessibility is, yeah, our conference is very inaccessible. It is financially inaccessible. It is physically inaccessible. Uh, it, it's, they, I agree that there's a lot aside from just kind of these Florida laws that bring barriers to our profession. Um, and there are a lot of profession for people or barriers for people with disabilities to, into our profession, into our professional spaces, which again, is alarming, right? Because we're all about what? Extending people, opening up opportunities. Um, so thank you so much for that. So in these last couple minutes, I know we're over, so I'll just kind of go a little bit quick through this, but okay, so I don't like this. What can I do? Well, the first is you can, and if Laura, if you can drop the link in the chat, that would be great. Um, you can sign the petition created by Diversity National and Diverse OT Collective. Uh, you can email the AOTA board of directors and tell them to cancel AOTA Inspire 2024 or move states. And again, in that resource guide, you'll have pre-written emails if you're someone who needs an email template. You can also email your state OT association to tell them to boycott OTA, AOTA Inspire 2024, along with their templates for program directors, clinical directors, and there are templates for students as well. Um, you can educate your colleagues, coworkers, and classmates on what's going on with AOTA Inspire 2024 and the general issues within the OT profession. So going back to some things like Josephine just mentioned, which general accessibility, accessibility to disabled people, looking um, further to, to, to really solidify what we're doing in practice. Um, that's having those conversations. We can boycott AOTA Inspire 2024, which can be look like withdrawing posters and presentations not responding to the call of paper for papers, not going. And we can stop donating to AOT PAC because as of right now in this present moment, every dollar to AOT PAC is money to harm. Um, we also, uh, Diverse OT National, uh, we have a community action committee. Um, so I know some people wanted to stay in touch. So um, we please be on the lookout uh, in the next few weeks on our Instagram, which is diverse OT underscore national. Uh, the purpose of our community action committee is going to be twofold. So we have five chapters nationally, and it's going to be supporting um, community actions within their own um, their own universities and their schools saying, how can we support you in these different places? And on a national level, our community action committee is going to be really uh, focused on bringing all of us together and having a place routinely to be able to talk about the issues that's going on and also to take action. Because like I said, um, there are plenty of people who are doing the work, right? But we're all spread out. We don't get to talk to each other. We don't see the other things that people are doing. So if we bring our collective power together, we can engage in collective action. Uh, we can, you can utilize the resource guide that was provided. There are so many resources in there. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, Diverse OT, if you look, thank you, Laura, so much for dropping the link tree. If you click on our link tree, you'll also see different action paths. There's one about the neuroscience of injustice. There is one for, um, for today. And then there is one about our uh, solidarity and solutions, which talks more about it goes more in depth on this, what can I do? If you watch our Solidarity and Solutions presentation and look at that action pack, there are so many resources in there for you all um, that we've worked really hard to put together and to cultivate that really gives a starting place for action, right? Because a lot of times to take action, people are like, I don't know where to start. So we're trying to address that. Um, you can learn more about the laws impacting LGBTQ plus people, Black people, Latinx people, uh, DACA recipients, um, Muslim populations, the disability community, immigrant community, et cetera. It is our responsibility collectively to stay in the know. And so that's something you can do. You can also donate time, money, or effort to local organizations that support oppressed population. Uh, and that brings us to our question, what, well, what will I do if, if I don't have AOTA or if I don't go to AOTA Inspire? You can rely on your community. Together, we can pull access to journal articles and other resources. We can collaborate. We can also make recommendations to one another about different conferences to attend, um, different, different things that you can do. There is, there is life beyond AOTA, right? 
there's AOTA represents, I think, like you said, Josephine, 30% of the OT community. Well, there's another 70% and we can really rely on each other. Um, we can also engage in networking opportunities that are offered by other OT and allied health organizations. So I know just by diversifying my Instagram follows to different um, one, for example, is the Black Allied Health Therapist. Um, we did an a meeting together, but like, for example, oh, well, then I started going to some of their networking events. That gives me somewhere else to go. Uh, we can, can create the future we hope to work and live in um, just by being kind and empathetic and also critical of the world around us and really engaging in that critical thinking. And then we can continue to apply outside pressure to AOTA to encourage change, right? Boycotts don't last forever. I'm not saying let's leave AOTA forever, but that's how real, meaningful, and systemic change occurs. Because if we keep on showing up, if we keep on giving AOTA our money, that says to AOTA, OTA, oh, well, they don't care. They're going to show up anyway. We can do whatever what. They're going to be there. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of scared, right? Because change is scary. And I want to normalize that and say, it's okay. It's okay to say, what the F is going on with my profession? What is going on here? Um, but we can't be too scared that we don't act against injustice. Institutions, which includes institutions like AOTA, are created to protect power. And the only way for them to change is to challenge them with people power. And that's known as collective action. So by signing these petitions, by writing these emails, by being very vocal about what we want to see change, that's collective action. That's what we're doing. Even being here today, learning together, this is collective action and we can keep that going. That's the only way to challenge an institution. AOTA is an institution and we have to understand that. And then when we collectively act, which again, boycotts, petitions, emails, we force institutions to pay attention and respond to our calls for demands. And it's important to know that collective action is what gained many of our rights, right? So look at our civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. Civil rights for Black people, disability rights, gay rights, and the women's rights, all movements of the 50s and 60s. I would really highly encourage you all to go back and really look at those movements and look at what it took to get to where we are today. And honestly, so many of these rights that we gain from these movements are ones that are being stripped away. Uh, I think a nice entry point, if you're someone who completely is unaware of any type of uh, civil rights movement, um, if you have Netflix, Crip, I put Crimp, Crip Camp is a great entry point to learn about the disability rights movements and how that affects how we are and got to where we are today. So that is all that I have for, for today. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I will hang back for a few minutes in case anyone wants to keep 